17-year-old Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick had big plans for the future. Brilliant and driven, the young woman was a senior in high school with plans of going into law. She had a high GPA, worked two part-time jobs, and wanted to give back to the world. On March 15, 1989, Tracy went to work the closing shift at a clothing store and never came home. In what can only be described as a brutal and violent murder, someone viciously stabbed Tracy to death in the storeroom at her job. She was discovered by a mall security guard who found the store unlocked with all of the lights on nearly two hours after closing. For the next 30 years, her case would become one of the most haunting mysteries in the state of Maryland. Three months after the murder, a man called a private hotline and made a disturbing confession. Calling himself Don, the man claimed to have murdered Tracy. That call would later be tracked down to a town not far from where the crime had been committed. And when the caller was identified, he had no interest in speaking to investigators. Some believe that Tracy was the victim of a random act of violence, while others suggest a crime of passion. Accusations have flown of a cover-up launched by a powerful figure in the community and a botched investigation, but the truth has remained elusive. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 84, The Murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the haunting murder of 17-year-old Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at TraceEvPod, on Instagram at TraceEvidencePodcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash traceevidence, where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. Also, stick around at the end of today's episode for details regarding a contest that could make you a part of Trace Evidence. Today we examine the murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick, a disturbing case with little evidence and a lot of theories. This is episode 84, The Murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick. Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick was born to parents Diane and Bill Kirkpatrick on June 9, 1971. Tracy would be one of four children the family would eventually have, with her having two sisters and a brother. Tracy's official location of birth is listed as East Liverpool, Ohio, though she would be raised in the state of Maryland, in the unincorporated community of Point of Rocks. Located in Frederick County, Point of Rocks is a small town with a population of just over 1,000, seated in the west of the state on the border with Virginia. Growing up in Point of Rocks gave the Kirkpatrick family that small town experience. It was the type of place where most people knew one another. There was a lot of waving when driving through town, and it was also one of those places where people didn't worry much about locking their doors. The most trouble that ever seemed to crop up would be the occasional party or teenagers knocking on doors and running during the night. Indeed, Point of Rocks was an idyllic location to raise a family, and the Kirkpatricks very much enjoyed their lifestyle. Tracy's father, Bill, was a truck driver at the time, and Diane worked in retail, eventually making her way into management. They both enjoyed their careers, though the tragic events which would later befall Tracy would forever alter the course of their lives, and their jobs would eventually become too difficult to continue. Tracy has been described by friends and family as incredibly intelligent, insightful, thoughtful, talented, and funny. 
While Tracy's sisters, Deonda and Angie, played sports, Tracy herself wasn't exactly the athletic type. According to Deonda, Tracy played softball for a season, though it wasn't something she was interested in continuing, and her pursuits were more targeted towards academics, though she had an artistic side as well. In an interview with Frederick Magazine, Bill Kirkpatrick discussed how Tracy had an interest in modeling. With vibrant red hair set to contrast her hazel eyes, Tracy had a very appealing look, but her interest in modeling seemed to have been impacted by her disinterest in being the subject of photography. Bill would go on to explain, quote, She loved taking pictures, but she would not let you take a picture of her. Every one of them has her hand up blocking, so you would not take a picture of her. End quote. In a lot of interviews, Tracy has been described as being shy, and that would certainly seem to be the case in terms of her response to being photographed. Obviously, there are photos of Tracy out there in which she isn't hiding from the camera, and it's easy to note in those images that the young woman was highly photogenic. If there's anything about those photos which truly stands out, it's her smile. And according to friends, Tracy's smile was contagious. Tracy enjoyed goofing around, making others laugh and generally having a good time. Her sister, Angie, recalled being driven to school by her older sister, explaining, quote, She loved listening to the radio really loud in the car. I remember always doing goofy stuff at the wheel and listening to the radio. End quote. Tracy was also extremely intelligent, an honor student who maintained a GPA that always fell between 3.75 and 4.0 while attending Brunswick High School in nearby Brunswick, Maryland. According to Deonda, Tracy had a knack for education, and she thought that her younger sister might have a bright future ahead of her as a teacher. As far back as to the times when they were just small children, Deonda recalls how Tracy often took on the role of a teacher in their games. Deonda explained, quote, When we played school at the house, she was always the teacher. She did a chalkboard. We had homework and everything. I think she would have been an excellent teacher if she had wanted to go into teaching. End quote. According to Deonda, Tracy often expressed that she'd wish she was popular and outgoing like her older sister. But Deonda herself admitted that she'd much rather have possessed her younger sister's intelligence. Tracy's appreciation for academics was undeniable. And as she grew older, she found herself drawn into literature, especially poetry. As Tracy read and studied poetry more, she began to try her own hand at the art form. She'd fill notebook pages with poems, short and long. And while penmanship has been described as not her strongest suit, she had a great feel for poetry and was able to construct meaningful, deep, and powerful pieces. In fact, in 1988, when she was just 16 years old, she submitted some poetry for publication. Later that year, one of Tracy's poems appeared in the New American Poetry Anthology. According to Diane, her daughter wrote a lot of sad poems and seemed to find comfort in them, explaining, quote, She expressed her feelings through her writing. She wrote a lot of lonely poems. End quote. It's interesting to examine the artistic aspects of Tracy's life as oftentimes someone will lean more towards the arts, or logic and precision-based courses. Yet for the young woman, as she came closer to completing high school, her college plans involved studying accounting and eventually making her way towards law. It was clear to those around Tracy that there was little she couldn't accomplish if she simply put her mind to it. By 1989, Tracy was 17 years old and coming towards the end of her high school career, Perhaps as the result of her intelligence or just because she was always the type to harbor responsibility, the young woman found herself working two part-time jobs in addition to her academic life. She had previously saved up money and purchased a used car, a Pontiac Grand Prix, wanting to do things herself without having to turn to her parents for assistance. This applied to her future as well, and while her parents told Tracy that she didn't need to worry about covering her college tuition, she wanted to chip in rather than just hand her parents a bill. She had applied to Mount St. Mary's University, some 30 miles away in Emmitsburg, and was looking forward to carving out a career path for herself. When asked about her sister and her future, Deonda responded, quote, She was funny, she was shy, she was beautiful, she was smart. She had her life planned out. She knew where she was going to go and what she needed to do to get there. End quote. 
Tracy worked at two different stores in the West Ridge Square Shopping Center, located along the Golden Mile on US Route 40 in the nearby city of Frederick. Frederick was quite different from Tracy's hometown, with a population more than 20 times that of Point of Rocks in the 1980s. Frederick, the seat of Frederick County, has continued to grow over the years and today is a busy, packed location with more than 60,000 residents. However, Despite the ever-growing city, the details surrounding Tracy's final moments continue to haunt the bustling town. Having both jobs located in the same place certainly made scheduling easier for Tracy, who would drive the 13 miles into Frederick where she could work in either Barnett Shoes or Eileen's, a store specializing in women's sportswear. The West Ridge Square Shopping Center has been described in many locations as a traditional mall, though this isn't exactly accurate. There's no major interior hub through which one might access multiple stores. Instead, the center is laid out as a strip mall, with each store having exits leading directly into the parking lot. While the Kirkpatrick family didn't exactly like the idea of Tracy working at night and walking to her car alone, there were security guards employed at the mall, and Tracy felt it was safe, especially since one of the guards was also a sheriff's deputy. On the evening of Tuesday, March 14, 1989, Tracy was running late arriving home, which was unusual for her. Most of the stores in the mall closed at 9 p.m., and for Tracy, she would quickly go through the closing procedures with her boss before locking up and heading home, arriving typically around 9.30 p.m. Bill was fairly strict with his children, with Deonda later explaining, quote, We weren't even allowed to date until we were 18. She had just gotten her license, and most school nights she had to come home right from work, because she got off at nine, end quote. Tracy always closed with her boss or another coworker, though she was scheduled to close by herself the next day. With Tracy running late, her parents placed a call to Eileen's but didn't receive an answer. So Bill decided to take a drive into Frederick to check on Tracy. Tracy had previously told her parents that if she didn't call or come home by 11 p.m., they should come check on her because something was obviously wrong. Tracy's car had been encountering some mechanical issues in the previous days, and so Bill considered the possibility that his daughter had run into car trouble. He previously had to drive up to the mall to jump Tracy's car when her battery had died. When Bill arrived, he was reportedly surprised to find Tracy talking with a former boyfriend. Apparently, she'd lost track of time and forgotten a call. She apologized for worrying her parents and ensured Bill that it wouldn't happen again. She knew to call home if she was going to be late, but it was young love and she'd gotten distracted. Reportedly, Tracy and her former boyfriend reconnected that night and decided to give their relationship another try. Tracy was excited by the prospect of new possibilities together. This detail, though, will later make others wonder if it could have played a role in why Tracy was ultimately murdered. On Wednesday, March 15th, Tracy was scheduled to work a closing shift at Eileen's, and this would be the first time the 17-year-old was set to close the store by herself. Tracy left high school at approximately 1 p.m. that day as part of a work-study program and drove over to the mall for work. Around 4 p.m., Tracy visited Barnett Shoes, the other store where she worked, before returning to Eileen's. It wasn't exactly a busy night, but Tracy was looking forward to being on her own and taking on more responsibility. At approximately 6 p.m., Diane stopped by to visit her daughter and bring her some food for dinner since, as she was working alone, she couldn't leave the store to grab something for herself. According to Diane, when she arrived, the store was empty, and she found Tracy sitting in the front counter reading a book. Diane and Tracy had a short conversation, and Diane later expressed that Tracy had told her that she was tired and was looking forward to getting home so she could go straight to bed. When Diane left, Tracy seemed to be in good spirits, there didn't appear to be anything amiss, and she had less than three hours left on her shift. Approximately two hours later, around 8 p.m., Tracy's boss, the head manager of Eileen's, stopped by to check on her before heading home. Reportedly, the store was again empty with no signs of customers anywhere. It was a slow night in general for the mall. As stores got closer to closing time, the thin trickle of customers slowly died out. In fact, when the store was later processed by investigators, it was found that not a single transaction had been rung up after 8 p.m. 
The manager left the store after a short visit and checking in on Tracy and explained that she could call if she had any issues closing. It's since been reported that the manager was the last person to see Tracy alive, leaving her at approximately 8.45 p.m. Tracy was left to straighten the store up, though this wouldn't take very long since there hadn't been many customers, add up receipts, count out her register, and lock up. Sadly, Tracy would not make it home that night, and much of what happened over the course of the next few hours has been shrouded in mystery for more than 30 years. Sometime after 9 p.m., Don Barnes Jr., a Frederick County Sheriff's deputy who moonlighted as a private security guard for the strip mall, reported noticing that the lights were still on in Eileen's. According to Barnes, he didn't think much of it at the time and assumed that whoever was working that evening was likely finishing up. Remember, the store closed at 9 p.m., and so for the lights to still be on a few minutes after was likely typical and wouldn't necessarily register any alarm for the security guard or anyone else working in the mall. If you've ever worked a closing shift at a clothing store, or any store really, you know that there's usually a 10 to 15 minute time lapse between locking the doors and finally leaving for the night. Barnes returned to the area of Eileen's more than an hour later, around 10.30 p.m., and noticed that the lights were still on. This was the first time he became concerned that something might be wrong, and so he approached the store and found the front door unlocked. Stepping inside, Barnes began calling out for anyone who might be present in the store, but received no answer. According to Barnes, there was nothing blatant in the store to suggest any issues, no signs of disarray or any kind of dispute or struggle. As he approached the front register, Barnes found things neat and orderly, but he still couldn't locate anyone within the building. When Barnes went deeper into the store, he found himself entering the storage room, and there, on the floor, he found Tracy. There was blood everywhere around her body, and it was clear that she had been stabbed a multitude of times in what has since been described as incredibly brutal. Upon making the grisly discovery, Barnes immediately began radioing for police. The call reportedly came into the police at 10.50 p.m. Around the same time that Barnes was urgently calling for assistance, Bill and Diane Kirkpatrick were walking out of their home to begin the drive to Frederick. While Tracy had been late the night before, the Kirkpatricks thought it highly unlikely that this would happen again, especially since Tracy had been closing alone and told her mother that she was tired. Bill and Diane arrived at the West Ridge Square Shopping Center around 11 p.m. and were met with what has since been described as a swarm of police vehicles, an ambulance, and vehicles from the fire department. There were people in uniform everywhere, going in and out of the store, as well as congregating in the parking lot. Parking their car, Bill still wasn't yet prepared for the truth that he was going to encounter. Perhaps due to denial or hoping for the best, he convinced himself that Tracy may have been the victim of an armed robbery and that she was likely inside at that moment, giving her statement to police. Neither he nor Diane could have imagined that their beautiful daughter had been murdered, nor could they comprehend the reason why anyone would want to harm the sweet, kind, and caring young woman. As they approached the store, a line of police officers denied them entry. Bill argued with the police, explaining who he was, but at the time, investigators weren't sure of the victim's identity, and therefore didn't have any reason to admit Bill and Diane. It was an absolutely chaotic scene, and when things were slowly worked out, Bill and Diane were given the terrible news. Reportedly, when Bill addressed an investigator and asked if Tracy was all right, he was met only with the silent response of the officer who solemnly shook his head, no. Diane almost immediately broke down and went into shock. She was quickly subjected to emergency medical treatment and was taken to the local hospital, the horror of the truth being too much for her to bear. Numb and lost, Bill accompanied his wife to the hospital and it was from this location that several phone calls were made to family and friends. Family members began arriving at the hospital, and this became a gathering point for those who knew and loved Tracy. With Diane temporarily incapacitated, the family was completely shocked by the news. Everyone wanted to know what had happened, who had committed the crime, and when investigators were going to arrest the killer, but those answers were not going to come along quickly, and some of them have yet to come along. Investigators on the scene made note of several details which they felt might play a role in helping to identify a possible suspect. 
Firstly, there had been no forced entry to the store as the front door was unlocked and the back door reportedly had no signs that it had been tampered with. While Tracy had been brutally stabbed, there was no indication of a fight or a struggle in the storage room, nor did investigators initially note anything resembling defensive wounds. The cash register was still closed and there was $60 found inside. Tracy herself was fully clothed and there was no indication of an attempted sexual assault or anything other than the stabbing itself. I have read in several locations that Tracy's purse was missing from the scene of the crime, though I've been unable to independently verify that detail. According to authorities, they had a victim with no motive that they could discern. Judging from the money in the register, police didn't think this was a robbery gone bad, and since Tracy didn't appear to have engaged in a fight with her attacker, police began working with a theory that she had known her attacker and likely trusted this person enough to allow them into the storeroom. Tracy's sister Deonda, though, has speculated since that maybe Tracy didn't know her killer, but was caught off guard and didn't have a chance to fight back. Investigators did capture several latent fingerprints which they believe may have been left by the killer, but I've also seen reports that they believe the killer may have either worn latex gloves or nylon on their fingers to obscure fingerprints from being fully detected. Blood droplets were also found leading from the scene of the murder into a rear hallway and they stopped down on the loading dock near some trash cans, suggesting that the killer had exited the store via the back door which would explain why no one witnessed anyone exiting the store through the main entrance that night. An autopsy was conducted on Tracy in the days following her murder. The pathologist's report detailed the disturbingly brutal manner of her death, explaining that Tracy had been stabbed no less than 22 times, sustaining wounds to her head, neck, arms, chest, and back. Three stab wounds located on Tracy's head caused multiple skull fractures, while two other stabs punctured vital organs, including one of her lungs. The final cause of death was determined to have been due to massive internal bleeding and trauma related to injuries to her internal organs and head. In terms of the weapon, the official report notes that the killer had likely used a single-edged blade, though the murder weapon itself was not found at the scene, nor has it ever been recovered. The pathologist confirmed the absence of defensive wounds and believed that Tracy had either known her assailant or had been taken by surprise. The violence and brutality associated with the murder further fueled beliefs by investigators that the crime was personal and that whoever committed it was extremely angry with Tracy. Whether or not the crime was premeditated was unknown, though there has been discussion amongst investigators that it may have been a spur-of-the-moment so-called crime of passion. With the knowledge that Tracy had been speaking with a former boyfriend, there are those who believe that this may have led someone with interest in Tracy to lash out with jealousy and anger. In the weeks following the murder, police had little to go on. The Kirkpatrick family was devastated by the loss of Tracy and was emotionally expressive in interviews with local media. The murder shocked Frederick, and to this day, the murder of Tracy Kirkpatrick is one of only 13 cases listed as open investigations in the entire county. The lack of suspects was disturbing, to say the least. Police canvassed the area and spoke to multiple people who had been at the mall that night as both patrons and employees, but no one noticed anyone exiting Eileen's after 8.45. In fact, one man who had been sitting in a car in the parking lot waiting on his girlfriend was parked not far from the store and he didn't see anyone enter or exit Eileen's. I should note, there's been a lot of discussion about the way the crime scene itself was handled. There have been accusations that investigators may have contaminated some evidence at the scene, and even investigators who worked the case have acknowledged, years later, that it may not have been properly handled. Other members of law enforcement have noted that the mall was located nearby to a busy interstate, and that for reasons unknown, Local police did not reach out to state police for assistance, as the killer could easily have fled via the interstate. Years later, when asked about the investigation, retired Frederick Police Department Detective Corporal Bob Servacek cryptically responded, quote, What derailed the process was politics and personal agendas. Certain individuals did not do their jobs and derailed the case. End quote. Ultimately, without any information and with hope for justice growing thin, the Kirkpatrick family had Tracy buried in Oak Grove Cemetery in Pennsylvania. 
It became a matter of waiting for answers and hoping for police to uncover the truth. But that wait would take a hard toll on the family, especially Bill and Diane. The loss of Tracy impacted them dramatically, with Diane growing more and more isolated over the years. She began to feel as though she couldn't leave her own home without the company of her husband or one of her children. She would eventually leave her job in retail management, expressing that it was just too difficult. Every time she saw a young woman working the register at night, she'd think of Tracy and the pain would come flooding back in. For Bill, his job as a truck driver afforded him far too much time to think. Those long stretches of road let his mind wander, and it would always wander to Tracy. Eventually, Bill would also leave his job, and together, he and Diane would struggle to keep their lives together. Three long months would pass before there would be even a hint of movement on Tracy's case. While the Frederick Police Department acknowledged that it was an ongoing investigation, it was clear that there wasn't much for them to work with. Without even so much as a motive, it was difficult to try and narrow down a potential list of suspects, let alone persons of interest. Then, authorities would receive a tip from a completely unexpected source. At the time, there was a hotline operating out of Las Vegas, Nevada. It was, for lack of better terms, a confession line. Basically, people could dial into the line anonymously and leave a voicemail confessing something they'd been keeping secret. Many of these calls revolved around unfaithful spouses and petty crimes. Once the messages were reviewed, they'd be made available on the hotline so that others could call in simply to listen to the anonymous confessions. There's apps out there that do a very similar thing today, though the confessions are typically in text nowadays. Six investigators were assigned to Tracy's case from the outset, though it would be Corporal Barry Honer who would take on the mantle of lead investigator. Corporal Honer was eventually contacted by an officer working for the Las Vegas Police Department. According to the Vegas Police, they had received audio from the hotline and they were contacting the Frederick Police Department to see if it matched up with any unsolved homicides. The call was a confession, which referenced a murder that had taken place in Frederick, where the caller alleged to have stabbed a young woman to death in a women's clothing store. Honer was immediately intrigued and requested a copy of the audio which was provided for him. In the call, a man who refers to himself as Don admits to murdering Tracy with a knife in the storage room of the clothing store. I will now play a clip of this call. While the audio can at certain times be difficult to decipher, it's been generally agreed that the caller identifies himself as Don, though some believe he may have been saying Sean or even John. He goes on to explain that there's many people in Frederick with that name, so it wouldn't be easy to track him down. The caller specifies that he used to visit the victim at a women's clothing store where she worked, and that one night they got into an argument. At that time, the caller claims he pulled out a knife, which he always carried with him, and killed her. Later in the call, he says the name Tracy, and also says that while he considered turning himself in, that won't bring Tracy back, and since Maryland has the death penalty, he won't be turning himself in. He then apologizes for what he has done, and concludes the call. Shocked by the context of the call, Corporal Honer listened several times before bringing it to Frederick Police Chief Richard Ashton. 
Ashton agreed that the call sounded legitimate, and in an interview on Unsolved Mysteries, Corporal Honer explained, quote, The sincerity that I heard in that voice, and the knowledge that the person was displaying, talking about what he had done, at that point convinced me that I was probably listening to the killer, end quote. Police were able to trace the call, and surprisingly, it led to a payphone at a Safeway supermarket located just eight miles outside of Frederick in Walkersville. In hopes of gathering more information, and hopefully to identify the suspect, Chief Ashton released the call's full audio to four local radio stations, who all agreed to air it at 9.15 a.m., so that anyone listening to any of their stations at that time would hear it. Corporal Honer then penned a letter, addressed to the so-called Don, where he urged him to come forward and speak with authorities. The letter, written in October of 1989, was then published to the front page of the Frederick News Post. The letter, in part, read, quote, I am personally willing to work with you to resolve this tragic situation, and I pray you now will come forward to relieve the hurt which Tracy's family and friends have suffered, as well as the pain which has consumed your life since that night, end quote. Honer acknowledged initially that he was concerned they would be flooded with tips and find themselves caught up in a lot of wild goose chases, but to his surprise, only eight tips were phoned in. Of those eight, seven were eliminated through investigation, but one remained a possibility. In a bizarre turn of events, the one tip originated from the state of Massachusetts and was called in by a woman who claimed she could positively identify the voice on the call. Martha Woodworth was operating as a psychic slash astrologer when she received a call from a man named Sean. According to Woodworth, Sean expressed to her his interest in trying to put together information about the murder of a young woman named Tracy with whom he alleged to have been friends. Interested in seeing what she could do, Woodworth provided Sean with an address and requested that he mail her newspaper clippings about the case so she could examine them. When Woodworth received the clippings, she immediately felt that something was wrong. In her own words, quote, I sensed immediately that he was very likely the killer. All of his A's and O's had a line slashed through them, for one thing. There were other indications as well, from the point of view of handwriting analyst, end quote. Concerned, Woodworth took it upon herself to contact the Frederick Police Department. At that time, Woodworth was asked to continue corresponding with Sean so she might see what else he had to say. Woodworth agreed, and eventually, after several back-and-forth conversations, the Frederick Police Department decided to speak with the so-called Sean. The address the writer had been using was in Walkersville, Maryland, approximately seven miles outside of Frederick, and not very far from the Safeway from which the Las Vegas hotline call had been made. When authorities approached the home of the writer, who they would later confirm was neither named Sean or Don, they were given the cold shoulder. The man refused to speak with authorities or grant them access to his home. As a result of this, Frederick police were able to obtain a search warrant and return to the man's home the next day at approximately 1 a.m. Reportedly, police took several items from the man's home including newspaper clippings about Tracy's case, as well as information in regard to Martha Woodworth. In addition to items taken from the home, a hair sample was also taken from the man. According to multiple articles written about this bizarre situation, the man, when questioned about Tracy's murder, pled the fifth multiple times and refused to answer any questions at all. It's since been stated by the Frederick Police Department that the man who wrote the letters as well as the man who made the call to the Las Vegas hotline were one and the same. Despite this, in the years since, this man has been listed as cleared by the Frederick Police Department, and they do not believe he was involved in the murder. Frankly, the situation involving this man is really complicated, and there's so many different angles to it, it's difficult to know for certain what exactly went on. When asked about this situation later, it was explained that there was not enough evidence to tie this man to the crime, and Chief Ashton stated, quote, Realistically, even if he did make the call, it doesn't mean he killed Tracy Kirkpatrick. It's important to keep that in perspective. End quote. For what it's worth, Martha Woodworth has stood by her belief that the letter writer was involved, and Corporal Honer has confirmed that the man who wrote the letters was someone they had looked at as possibly having murdered Tracy in the past. There was, however, another potential person of interest. 
This person is a highly controversial figure when it comes to this case, and depending on who you ask, he was either a very likely suspect or has been needlessly subjected to rumor and speculation. His name is Don Barnes Jr., and you may remember that he was the sheriff's deputy and mall security guard who initially discovered Tracy's body. The verse detail, which made investigators somewhat suspicious of Barnes' story, was in regard to his whereabouts between the hours of 9 p.m. when he says he noticed the lights still on in Eileen's and 10.50 p.m. when he contacted the Frederick police to report his discovery. Several people have reported that the West Ridge Square Shopping Center is not exactly a large one, and my research has shown there to be 26 stores located in the Strip. Of course, that's a current number. I'm unsure how many stores were there in 1989, but probably fewer. This led many to wonder how it was possible that Barnes could have noted the lights on at 9 p.m., but not return to the area of Eileen's until nearly two hours later. Where could he have been during that time? Barnes himself was reportedly never able to explain exactly where he had been during this time, or at least he hadn't been able to do so in a way in which investigators believed. Reportedly, he was doing his rounds, though investigators don't believe those rounds would have kept him away from the area of Eileen's for as long as they supposedly did. If you'll recall earlier, I quoted Corporal Bob Servacek, who explained years later that the case had remained unsolved due to politics and personal agendas, and many believe this may have been referring to Barnes, though that can't be confirmed. Some, though, do believe that this was referring to Barnes, as at the time of the murder, he was 25 years old and the son of the former sheriff of Frederick County, Don Barnes Sr. Sr. had worked for the Maryland State Police from 1963 to 1969. He then worked for the state fire marshal's office until he ran for and was elected to the position of sheriff in 1974, becoming the county's youngest ever sheriff. I do want to address one detail here. I've seen multiple accounts that, at the time of the murder, Sr. was still sheriff. But according to his obituary, he left office in 1982 and entered the private sector. I have tried to verify this through the websites for Frederick County as well as the official sheriff's office website, but both pages which provide links to a list of all sheriffs that have ever worked in the county have led to 404 errors and missing pages. I should note that Senior was also involved in music and many have referred to him as a powerful individual in the community throughout his life. There's a pretty solid dividing line when it comes to this. There are those who believe that Barnes Jr. committed this crime and was ultimately protected due to his father's status. There are others who argue that Barnes Jr. was never anything other than a good man and that his father would never have used his connections to protect his son from possible involvement in a homicide. Barnes Jr.'s daughter has been fairly vocal about her belief that her father committed the murder, going so far as to say he was single at the time, enjoyed flirting with younger women, and she even tells a story that her father left the mall that night, stopped by his estranged wife's home, and changed uniforms before returning to the mall. I can't verify that, and when authorities have addressed Barnes Jr., they've stated only that they have no evidence to make that connection. When asked about Barnes Jr.'s daughter's statements, one officer explained that the relationship between father and daughter was not very good, and that the daughter may have an axe to grind. It's also important to say, I've never seen full verification that the woman who claims to be Barnes' daughter actually is. I also want to add that I, by no means, am trying to impugn the characters of Senior or Junior, but am merely following discussion and speculation surrounding this case. I've never seen any solid evidence to link Barnes Jr. to the murder, but it is a highly discussed topic amongst those who lived in and around Frederick at that time. Barnes Jr. moved out of the country, to Egypt, sometime following the crime, though he later returned to the country and now lives in the southeast. While many have since argued that Corporal Servicek's comments about the politics and agendas was referring to Barnes, Servicek himself seems to contradict that theory. In an interview conducted by the Frederick News Post in 2009, Servicek was quite blunt about his thoughts on the case. In this interview, Servicek revealed that back in 1994, evidence was provided to the grand jury to indict a suspect. Ultimately, two-thirds of the grand jury voted to indict, but the district attorney reportedly did not wish to pursue the case and risk losing and therefore granting the suspect protection under the double jeopardy rule. According to Servicek, the suspect was, at the time of the murder, 
a 17-year-old who had attended Brunswick High School with Tracy. Reportedly, this individual had a romantic interest in Tracy, and when that was not requited, he lashed out violently, murdering her. Servicek felt there was more than enough evidence to get a conviction, and even stated, quote, This case was solved in 1994, as far as I was concerned. End quote. I wish there was more information about this potential suspect, but a name has never been revealed, and outside of Servicek's statements about the grand jury, little has ever been publicized about this angle of the case. In terms of developments in the past 30 years, there have been few. Sometime in the mid-2000s, Tracy's case was presented to Vidoc Society, which is made up of investigators who evaluate cold cases. Reportedly, this group described the case as solvable and gave a list of suggestions to an investigating officer to follow up on. In a 2019 interview with the Frederick Magazine, Sergeant Andrew Alcorn of the Frederick Police Department, when asked about these suggestions, stated, quote, He followed up on some of them. He didn't get to all of them before he got moved, so we're still looking to follow up on some of those tasks. End quote. In March of 2009, 20 years after Tracy's murder, for the first time, samples recovered from the crime scene were sent out for DNA testing. There have been subsequent DNA tests that have been conducted in the years since, though no news has ever been released in regard to any potential matches and it's noted that the Frederick Police Department is in possession of DNA samples from at least two individuals that they consider persons of interest. Earlier this month, Sergeant Alcorn spoke with a local news channel regarding Tracy's case. Alcorn explained that, for the first time in more than 10 years, rather than assigning the case to a single investigator, they were instead putting four to five experienced detectives in charge of reinvestigating. The most recent update explained that they were interviewing suspects and looking for new ways to examine evidence collected over the years. For more than 30 years, the Kirkpatrick family has sought the truth of who murdered Tracy. In multiple interviews, their pain and sorrow is clear to see, and their frustration with the system is also evident. In the absence of evidence, three main theories have developed over the years as to who may have been responsible for Tracy's murder and what the motive may have been. The first theory puts forth the possibility that Tracy's murder may have occurred randomly and that while investigators initially believe she could have known her attacker, it's entirely possible that the assailant entered the store, snuck up on Tracy, and committed this brutal and heinous crime. The second theory argues that Don Barnes Jr., the security guard working the mall that night and the man who discovered Tracy's body, may have been involved in her murder and could possess information that he has never revealed. This is an incredibly controversial theory and has nearly as many detractors as it does supporters. The third and final theory purports that the man known as Sean, who contacted Martha Woodworth, allegedly made the call to the Las Vegas hotline and claimed to have known Tracy, may have committed this murder but was allowed to walk free when evidence could not be built up to secure an indictment. Some also believe that this man may in fact be the same high school student that Corporal Servicek believes murdered Tracy Kirkpatrick. Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick was a brilliant young woman with a bright future ahead of her. She worked two jobs, maintained a high GPA, dreamed of going into law, and was actively applying to colleges during her senior year of 1989. She touched the lives of everyone around her, and to this day, the memories of Tracy are cherished. Her life was taken in a brutal fashion on March 15, 1989, when someone stabbed her to death in the storage room of the clothing store she was working in. For more than 30 years, her family has had to grieve for her loss without ever being granted the closure of seeing someone brought to justice for it. Brunswick High School planted a tree in Tracy's honor, and the family have held candlelight vigils there over the years. Every year, on March 15th, Bill Kirkpatrick, along with members of his family, gather at the West Ridge Square Shopping Center. They have now done this 30 times, and with each passing year, it becomes more difficult to hold on to hope. Tracy's older sister, Deonda, later stated, quote, I didn't think I was going to be planning 30. Didn't think I was going to be planning 25. I don't know if I want to do 40.
The murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick is a case that's haunted me ever since I first saw it on Unsolved Mysteries back when I was a teenager. There's something incredibly disturbing about a young woman working alone in a mall being murdered. There's such a vulnerability there, and so many people, including myself, have worked retail jobs and at one point or another found ourselves as the only person in the store, closing up for the night. That feeling can be eerie, and the walk from the store to your car can often be frightening. In recent years, many stores have taken measures to ensure that no employee is ever alone at night, but people call in sick, things happen, and somewhere out there, someone is likely making that frightening walk alone tonight. I originally planned to release this episode all the way back in January. I'd gotten a lot of requests for it, and I suppose due to March being the 30th anniversary, that's to be expected. But something shifted, and I had to push the episode. Then when February came around, I was looking to finally get this episode out, but Robin Warder of The Trail Went Cold covered this case in episode 111. Rather than release my coverage around that time, I decided to wait, and now that five months have passed, I felt it was an appropriate time to release the episode. By the way, if you haven't, I highly recommend that you check out Robin's coverage of this case. We have varying points of view, but as always, Robin does a tremendous job dissecting the details. This is a difficult case to examine. Firstly, there's not a lot of evidence available for investigation, and beyond that, there hasn't been a wealth of media coverage, and what coverage does exist typically regurgitates the same information that you can find elsewhere. The Unsolved Mysteries segment, while interesting and respectful, focuses predominantly on the hotline caller without ever discussing any details about the security guard nor the high school student. Perhaps those details weren't available at the time. So you're looking at a case where you don't even have proof of what the motive is. Robbery doesn't seem to make sense since money wasn't taken from the cash register. There was no indication of sexual assault, nor were there signs of a struggle, which seems to imply that whoever committed this crime either knew Tracy and was able to attack her when she felt safe, or the assailant snuck up on her and killed her for reasons unknown. What can't be argued is that ultimately, this was about murder. Not murder coming as the result of some other crime which resulted in the killer going too far. For whatever reason, whoever killed Tracy Kirkpatrick wanted to kill her. Whether it was premeditated or spur of the moment remains up for debate. So we've got three essential theories here to look at, and to try and pass through the lens of what little information we can actually prove. Because this case is still listed as open, Freedom of Information Act request attempts to gather files and further information were denied. So that leaves us only with the theories, and the first theory considers the possibility that this may have been a random act of violence. When we look at this theory, we have to examine what we know. All that we really know is someone entered the Eileen store that Tracy worked in, was in possession of a knife, and by some route ended up stabbing the young woman 22 times, leaving her to die in the store's storage room. Typically, when you're looking at a random act of violence, you're looking at a crime of opportunity. Late in the evening at a strip mall, most of the stores preparing to close, not a lot of cars in the parking lot, not a lot of customers walking the strip. It isn't outside of the realm of possibility to imagine someone could have wandered into the store, noted that Tracy was alone, and decided this was the time they wanted to kill her. That would have to be the driving factor for a random act, right? We know robbery wasn't the motive, or if it was, the killer either failed to gain access to the register or fled due to fear after stabbing Tracy. This person would have apparently exited the store via the back entrance, proceeded down a corridor towards the dock, and disappeared into the night. Stabbing someone is a messy ordeal. When you shoot someone, it's going to make a mess, but you have the ability to have some distance between the killer and the victim. The killer can avoid getting messy or staining their clothes in any way that might draw attention. However, with a stabbing, this is up close and personal, and there's little doubt in my mind that whoever murdered Tracy would have been bloody when walking out of that store. The problem I have with this being random is the incredibly brutal nature of this crime. If this was just someone looking to murder Tracy, or a person who wanted to rob the store and things went bad, why 22 stabs? That's a hell of a lot of stabs and suggests a high level of anger towards the victim, which makes it feel more personal than random. Factor in that the stabs occurred in Tracy's head, neck, chest, back, and arms, 
and it's pretty clear that she was moving and likely trying to escape what was happening to her. So maybe the guy got carried away and wanted to make sure she was dead before he left. But it takes a special kind of sicko to stab someone that many times that brutally. It reminds me somewhat of the case of Suzanne Joven, covered in episode 5 of Trace Evidence, who was murdered just off the campus of Yale in 1998. So could it have been random? Yes, I mean, sadly, this kind of stuff does happen. And there are people out there who are sick and twisted enough to commit a crime like this. But when you put all the evidence side by side, and you look at all the theories, it doesn't seem like the most likely option. Investigators, basically since day one, have believed that Tracy knew her killer and that this was a crime of passion, motivated possibly by Tracy entering a relationship with someone, causing the killer to respond emotionally and violently. That leads us to the second theory, that Don Barnes Jr., the security guard working the mall that night, may have been involved. Before digging into this theory, I do want to make several notes about Don Barnes Jr. Now, the speculation is rampant that he was involved. People in Frederick, as well as those who have independently examined this case, have all suggested this as a possible answer. However, while the rumors may be tantalizing, a lot of them are very difficult to base in evidence. Yes, Barnes was there that night and discovered Tracy's body. Reportedly, he was making his rounds between 9 p.m. and 10.30 p.m., though many have argued it shouldn't have taken him that long to return to the store. That's kind of up for debate in my mind. For all we know, Barnes took a break from work that night to go get a burger or visit a woman or any number of other scenarios that could have taken him out of the area that he didn't want to admit to because they might make him look bad. I don't know whether or not Barnes was involved. All I can do is follow the facts and see where they lead. A lot of the speculation surrounding Barnes comes from a woman who claims to be his daughter. I've never seen it proven anywhere that this woman was in fact confirmed to be his daughter, by the way. Some have speculated that she may have been someone with mental health issues or someone who simply wanted to insert herself into the case. This happens a lot, unfortunately, with unsolved cases. How many people have claimed that their dad was Zodiac or killed Elizabeth Short or any other number of major crimes? A lot. That doesn't mean that what this woman said is untrue, but it does draw a lot of questions. However, I would like to say... If Don Barnes Jr.'s daughter is out there listening right now, I would love for you to contact me to discuss this further. All we really know is that Barnes was there that night, would have been someone that Tracy would have felt safe and secure enough around to be caught off guard, and who could have committed the crime, then taken his time to get his story straight, maybe change clothes, whatever he had to do before he returned to find the body and call in the report. Many people have argued that since his father was such a prominent member of the community, it's obviously a cover-up. While I'm not the type of person to just dismiss the possibility of a cover-up, you're talking about a cover-up that's lasted well over 30 years. Don Barnes Sr. passed away in 2010, nine years ago. Were he pulling the strings to keep his son out of hot water, why would those investigating the case still participate in this cover-up nearly a decade after his death? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it does seem kind of improbable. Even if you were afraid of Barnes Sr., you don't have anything to fear now. New investigators have worked the case. It's cycled through the hands of many different detectives over the past 30 years. It seems unlikely that all of these detectives would find information that seemed to link Barnes to the crime, but always run into the wall of those protecting him, and not a single one of them has ever, even under the blanket of anonymity, spoken to a reporter posted online, done anything to point a finger at Barnes. The last time I examined a murder case where a security guard was a suspect, the police said they'd ruled him out. Forty years later, that security guard was officially listed as the prime suspect and took his own life when law enforcement came to his door. That was the murder of Arliss Perry. And since then, I've been a little hesitant to dismiss a suspect simply because police have ruled them out. I try to be rational in the examination of these theories, and while I've got the conspiracy laid in mind that a lot of people do, and I really get pulled into a complex story with a lot of different angles, I need a little bit more than I've got here. If anything, I would consider Barnes a person of interest based purely on the fact that he was the one who found the body. I don't know to what extent Barnes was questioned following the murder. I've read reports that the questioning wasn't very thorough and that Barnes' vehicle was not examined for evidence or signs of blood. 
I've read that Barnes left the country not long after the murder and didn't return to the United States until many years later. While all of that is intriguing, I'm not sure that it's enough to really point the finger. I think Barnes is someone who should absolutely be re-interviewed with the Frederick Police Department looking at this case again in 2019, but it's very difficult to know what to think here. If you believe Barnes committed this crime, nothing I'm going to say is going to change your mind. If you believe he's innocent, nothing I'm going to say is going to change your mind. I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate mail accusing me of defending Barnes, and that's fine. But I'm not here to just guess. I'm trying to make the evidence fit the crime, not the other way around. I believe the possibility of Barnes being involved can neither be ruled in or out. The Frederick Police Department has been very quiet in regard to Barnes, saying very little, if anything, directly. But it's an open case, and they've been pretty tight-lipped about everything. In the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at these theories, if your choices are Barnes or a random act of violence, the manner of the crime, the apparent personal nature of it, Tracy's own vulnerability with someone she may have trusted, Barnes could certainly fit that mold, but so could a lot of people. I can't wait to hear what you think about this theory. I could discuss it all day, but when I really boil it down, all I can say is, it's possible. I just don't see enough evidence to prove it. But I also don't know what information the Frederick Police Department has held back over these 30 years. Some people have said that Barnes was interested in Tracy in a romantic way. Some have said that Barnes was known to flirt with younger women. Barnes worked at the mall where Tracy worked. Barnes ultimately made the horrifying discovery. That's sort of it. I've never seen anything to link the two. No one reported them ever talking. Tracy never complained about him flirting with her or even mentioned talking to him at all from what I can gather. Sure, they likely knew each other, but proving anything beyond that takes a lot more. I've worked at a store before with a creepy security guard who liked to hit on the young women. They weren't quiet about it, and everybody tended to know. That doesn't mean that that's the exact situation here with Tracy, but I would like to see more information that could connect the two beyond working in the same place and Barnes making the terrible discovery. A lot of people have made the connection to Barnes following the call that was made to the Las Vegas hotline. Remember, the caller identified himself as Don. And yes, some think he said Sean and others say John, but in every transcript provided by officials, the name is Don. Many people believe the caller was not the killer, but someone with information about the murder, and that by using the name Don, he was subtly trying to point a finger at Don Barnes Jr., that's a possibility, though it does make me wonder why if he was making a call to an anonymous hotline, why not just say Don Barnes Jr. murdered Tracy rather than using the name Don and claiming to have done it himself? This leads us into the third and final theory. Three months after Tracy's murder, this so-called Don calls this random confession hotline and tells the story about Tracy's murder. He alleges that he knew her, they got into an argument, he stabbed her, and that he felt bad about it, but he wasn't going to turn himself in. A lot of people believe that this was the killer, and that he was in some way trying to get himself caught, whether it was guilt or something else, but I don't know if I agree with that. If this guy wanted to get caught, he could have just called the Frederick Police Department and given them the same message. The call itself is bizarre, the way the man talks is strange, the details he gives feels very casual. If this was the killer, and he murdered this young woman in such a brutal way, he's awfully calm about it when discussing it. He doesn't go into much detail outside of information that could have been gathered by reading news articles about the case. Some investigators believe the caller was the killer, others not so much. I'm still trying to determine if the caller made his statements off the cuff or if he was reading from a prepared script. When the caller was tracked down through his writings to a psychic in Massachusetts, he didn't have much to say. Reportedly, he pled the fifth a lot, didn't want to answer questions, and was uncooperative. There was obviously enough there for police to get a warrant, at which time they searched the home, removed items, and took a DNA sample from him. There's never been much said about their examination of the items they took. At the time, police commented that the items were being sent to the lab for analysis, but nothing was ever said after that. Police confirmed that the man was neither Don or Sean, and that they didn't have enough evidence to link him to the murder. In fact, if you watch the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, they've since updated it. There's a casual line of text at the end of Tracy's story that just says that this guy has been ruled out, with no explanation. 
I've read a lot of speculation that at the time of the murder, Don Barnes Jr. lived in Walkerville, where the calls and letters originated from, and that he may have had a roommate named Sean. But my issue with that is I'm fairly certain if investigators had shown up at the home of the guy who had been making the call and writing the letters and served a search warrant and then discovered that the security guard who worked at the mall also lived there, they might have looked a little more closely. Now, sure, you could argue the cover-up angle here, and that's a possibility, but this is a lot of information to keep concealed. Newspapers were pretty much on top of this story at the time, and when the caller information was released, it became a big story. So many details were revealed, and even if the police were actively covering this up, it's a stretch to say no reporter would have discovered that Barnes lived at the address, or had previously lived at the address. And no, I've never found a single article that makes that link. Martha Woodworth, the psychic, says that she believes the man who wrote the letters and made the call was the killer. Of course, her belief is based around the fact that he was talking about the case and that his handwriting was suspicious and that she's a psychic. I'm not a huge proponent of handwriting analysis, it's not really an exact science, and I don't think I need to make it more clear where I stand on psychics. Beyond that, if DNA was indeed taken from this man and then compared to DNA from the scene in 2009 when they began testing it, the only way it wouldn't match would be as if the DNA they gathered did not belong to the killer. We know that the crime scene wasn't handled properly, so it's entirely possible that the DNA evidence was contaminated or not handled right, and they may never get a match. But again, like with the theory of Barnes, there's not much here to work with. Upon initial examination, it seems really strong, but the deeper you look, the more it begins to fall apart. The caller, the letter writer, the man police served a warrant on, has since been cleared, allegedly. The idea that the caller may have referred to himself as Don as some sort of wink and nod towards Don Barnes Jr. is intriguing, but makes little sense to me. Again, I can argue that the caller could have just said that Don Barnes Jr. killed Tracy Kirkpatrick. He had no way of knowing that the hotline would turn the call over to police, nor did he know they'd be able to track him down through that call. So why not just say what you really want to say? Some have argued that the caller may have been afraid and that the reason he didn't want to cooperate with authorities was he believed they'd kill him to continue the cover-up. And I can't really argue against that with logic, but it's been 30 years and this guy's never come forward with any new information or accusation against Barnes. And he's never been named either. At this time, police think the caller was simply someone who was interested in the case and said something to incriminate himself, not thinking it would actually come back to him. A sick joke, to say the least, but not the first nor the last time this will happen in connection to a murder. Corporal Servicek, many years later, discussed that evidence had been provided to the grand jury regarding a suspect that he fully believed murdered Tracy. This suspect, who has never been named, was a high school student at the time who Servicek argues had a crush on Tracy. According to Servicek, he believes that this suspect murdered Tracy when she told him that she thought of him only as a friend. It's an interesting story, and it certainly fits the idea of this being a very personal crime of passion. I should note, the Kirkpatrick family has spoken well of Servicek, and he certainly didn't point any fingers at Barnes or the caller. It was said in one article that he ate, slept, and breathed this case. If he worked it as thoroughly as is to be believed, and he's saying this may have been a student who knew Tracy, I think maybe we should pay some attention to that. Remember, Tracy allegedly got back together with her boyfriend the night before she was murdered. Then she goes to school, where this other guy could learn that information. Maybe he goes to see her to argue about it. Or he thinks he can change her mind. Or maybe he was just seeing red. It's really difficult to say, and just more speculation. Now, an interesting angle to this, a lot of people have wondered, could the high school student and the letter writer be the same person? I wish I could answer that for you, but neither name has ever been revealed. It's also important to note that when DNA analysis was run for the first time in 2009, police said they had narrowed things down to two possible suspects. Again, they never named these suspects. This has led many to wonder if one of them could be the high school student. It seems to me that were someone in high school capable of committing such a brutal and violent crime, that it's unlikely this person would have lived the next 30 years without ever getting into trouble with the law. Obviously, there would be a major mental health issue there, a proclivity towards violence against women. I don't know. If I were investigating this case, and I believe the high school student theory, I'd look at every male who attended Brunswick High School while Tracy attended, 
and see if any of them have ever been charged with any violent crime in the past 30 years. Three theories. All of them have their merits. All of them have reasons why they're unlikely. This case is exceedingly frustrating in that there's not really a lot of evidence to work with, and we don't really know what authorities know or believe. According to the most recent discussions between the Frederick police and the media, they believe this case is solvable. They're still working on it, and as recently as this month, they were planning to assign multiple detectives to re-examine all of the information and interview witnesses to see if they could shake anything loose. With the progress that's been made in DNA technology in the past 10 years, let alone 30, assuming the samples are strong enough, there's a chance they're going to get a genetic profile of the killer. Since this DNA evidence was initially examined in 2009, and we haven't heard a word about it since then, I am sadly not very optimistic about the quality of that evidence. 30 years ago, 17-year-old Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick went to work and lost her life in what can only be described as a brutal and violent attack. A family was shattered, a community shocked, and a young woman who had her whole life of possibilities ahead of her was taken. Everything she ever could have been was stolen. Her family lost the opportunity to grow with her, to see what she could have become. If alive today, Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick would be 48 years old. What gifts that she could have contributed to the world were we robbed of when a cowardly, violent person made the choice to murder her? He didn't just kill Tracy. He killed the possibilities of who Tracy may have become. In the years after her murder, Bill and Diane struggled. They redecorated the house and Tracy's room, but eventually had to move out. It was just too painful to confront her absence there every day. And yet, 30 years later, they're in their late 60s and early 70s. They could never have imagined that all this time would pass without knowing the truth. In an interview with Bill and Deonda, Tracy's older sister, Deonda broke down, acknowledging that she desperately wanted the truth to be discovered before her parents pass away. For their sake, for the Kirkpatrick family, and for Tracy, we can only hope the same. Unfortunately, without more information, a confession, or solid evidence, the murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick remains open and unsolved. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick, there are several articles and forums discussing her case. The Trail Went Cold has an episode discussing this case, and Unsolved Mysteries ran a short segment on it. Beyond that, a YouTube search of her name will bring up a heart-wrenching interview with Bill and Deonda Kirkpatrick. If you have any information about the murder of Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick, please contact Sergeant Andrew Alcorn of the Frederick Police Department at area code 240-674-2612. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. I'm going to play a quick promo for you from the podcast Wine and Crime, which you should absolutely check out. Stick around afterwards for information about a contest in which you can become a part of Trace Evidence. Hey, true crime fans, have you listened to Wine and Crime yet? We're a true crime comedy podcast hosted by three childhood friends who chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash our worst Minnesotan accents. Each week, us gals pick a true crime topic and pair it with a delicious wine before delving into the background and psychology behind the crime. Then we share and speculate wildly about a couple of bonkers cases related to the topic. Past episodes include necrophilia, cults, Crimes of Passion, Cruise Ship Disappearances, Exorcisms Gone Wrong, all this over a bottle of wine, or, let's be real, three. Listen anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wine and Crime Pod, and check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. Cheers! <laughs> Thank you.
So you've just heard a podcast promo, and that's what this contest is all about. Every year, I record a new promo to advertise Trace Evidence. And this year, rather than doing all the talking myself, I wanted to get you involved. What would you say to convince a friend to listen to Trace Evidence? What is it about Trace Evidence that you like? Write yourself a little script, record it, and send it to me. You can email me the audio file at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Or if you don't have the setup to record, you can leave a voicemail at 770-744-5104. Winners will have their clip inserted into the promo and will receive some Trace Evidence gear. For full contest details and information, visit trace-evidence.com slash promo. I look forward to hearing from you. A special shout out and thank you to Trace Evidence Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Krista Colvin, Diani Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Julia Rexon, Kate Alexander, Megan, Randy Wyland, Chandra Moreau, Tara Doble, Megan Cotter, and Tom Archer. Trace evidence wouldn't be possible without the kindness of all of you amazing listeners. Visit patreon.com slash trace evidence for more information. I want to thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. <laughs>